And um, hello and welcome to the SNOMED CT research webinar. I am Susie Roy, the Customer Relations Manager for the Americas Research Engagement Lead at SNOMED International and of course the host of the SNOMED CT research webinars. Um, you will notice that everyone is currently muted. Um, we've all become so accustomed to uh, Zoom webinars by now, but just for a little bit of housekeeping, um, if you have any questions as we go along, please go ahead and enter your questions into the Q&A box. And at the end of today's presentation, we'll have a short Q&A portion where Drs. Gliath and uh, Drs. Geller will be able to answer any of your questions. This webinar is being recorded and both the slides and the video will be available later this week. Actually, it'll probably happen next week, um, really. Um, let's see. Oh, is my uh, slide showing? It should have advanced. Is it? Okay. Um, <laughs> so those of you who are new today, welcome. Um, just to let you know, the SNOMED CT research webinar is just one of a series of webinars that we have. We also host clinical and implementation webinars. Um, where these other two webinars, the implementation and clinical, are more focused on clinical implementations of SNOMED CT. Whereas here at our research webinars, we definitely um, go off more into basic and applied um, research informatics. These webinars are always free of charge. You just need to register and you can attend the live events, or of course, you can also watch the recordings later. To get more information, you can visit snomed.org slash web dash series to see any of the upcoming presentations for these um, upcoming tracks. And of course, if you missed any of our previous webinars over the last two years, you can view those videos on our SNOMED International YouTube channel. You can hit like and subscribe and be notified of any time new videos, not just the uh, webinars for clinical implementation and research, but also all of our other uh, videos from our past expos, our value props series, and a whole lot more. And um, I also host the SNOMED CT research reference group. Um, essentially, this is a Google group where you can receive information about uh, SNOMED CT research related news. In order to join, you just have to email me, sro at snomed.org. Um, and I'll get you on that list. And I promise it's not um, a heavy spamming list. You have, um, we have just a couple of emails each month. And the last plug that I wanted to make today um, is for the, um, oops, sorry, is for the um, upcoming SNOMED CT uh, Expo. Last year, we had almost 2,000 people from over 70 uh, countries join, and uh, we expect this year our virtual expo to be just as big. So um, if you wanted to uh, join, again, this year it's free. You just have to register. You can go to snomed.org, our website, and um, across the top banner, you'll see the link to register for the expo. Um, if you have any questions about the expo, please don't hesitate to email me, sro at snomed.org. Okay, and now for the main event. So I'm very pleased to um, welcome both Dr. Vipina Cliff and Dr. James Geller to today's um, SNOMED CT research webinar. Dr. Vipina Gloff is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the School of Biomedical Informatics in the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. She recently completed her PhD from the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Computer Science, co-advised by Dr. Geller and Dr. Pearl. Previously, she worked as an assistant lecturer in the Department of Mathematical and Computational Sciences at the National Institute of Technology, Karnataka, India, and she holds two master's degrees in computer applications and a bachelor's degree in physics. Her research interests lie broadly in the domain of biomedical ontologies, terminologies, and clinical um, natural language processing. And Dr. James Geller is professor and former chair of the computer science department at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He has served as associate dean for research, um, and he received his PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo in computer science with a focus on AI and knowledge representation. 
He co-founded the Structural Analysis of Biomedical Ontologies Center at the Department of Computer Science. And he has published over 200 journal and conference papers and 14 book chapters in medical informatics, semantic web technology, object-oriented database modeling, and knowledge representation. Dr. Geller is the founding participant of Braid Consortium of Javi Mud uh, College and is actively involved in bringing women and minority into computing field. Dr. Geller is a fellow of American College of Medical Informatics and is a distinguished professor who has received numerous awards for his excellent teaching and for champion and advancing diversity. Thank you. Uh, today, Dr. Sloth and uh, Geller will be presenting extending import detection algorithms for concept import from two to three biomedical terminologies. And with that, I will send the screen over to you. So uh, thank you for the charming introduction. I should uh, hire you to introduce me in the future and everything <laughs> time. Nobody's ever done it as nicely as you just did. Um, and I just spent the last two and a half hours uh, in the medical office wrangling with them to make sure that the facts sent from one place to another place is actually received. And I probably could give a whole other talk just telling you about how difficult it was to get the facts from a from a lab to a, a doctor's office, but that will be for another time. I will stick with my uh, prepared talk. This is a, a little bit of a, a lifetime talk. So I'm going to do the lifetime introduction uh, and then Dr. Uh, Kellogg will do the, the real thing if you want. So uh, now, why is my screen not moving forward? Uh, that uh, doesn't start well. Oh, okay. Maybe now. Okay. So, so I'm going to give you a history, a very personal history uh, of this whole research. And then, uh, so Bipina will take over with the actual paper that we're describing here and another paper about ontology maintenance. And finally, a little bit of an overview over the work that we at the Sabok Research Center have done since uh, 1993, actually, in, in ontologies. Okay, so to make a short story long, uh, this research program started around 2008, 2009, when I was working mostly on the UMLS. Unified Medical Language System. Of course, you know that the metathesaurus in the UMLS is gigantic, uh, while the semantic network is relatively small. And, and I'm sure you know that every concept in the gigantic uh, metathesaurus of the UMLS is assigned a semantic type from the semantic network. And very often is one semantic type, but sometimes it's as many as six. So the last time I checked some 10 years ago, six was about the maximum that, that there could be. Okay, so, um, so uh, this is sort of a schematic, which I apologize, I didn't redraw. I just pulled it off an old paper. So we are on this side, on the concept side, and we have a concept Y, which is a child of the concept X, and they're connected by an isolink or our um, more theoretically oriented people will call it a classification axiom. And over here, this is the metathesaurus. And so we have a semantic type, which is assigned to the concept X and the semantic type, which is assigned to the concept Y. And then uh, there are links parallel to the links between, between uh, the concept uh, parent and child, which are going up here. Uh, and if you look at this, you find that there is a semantic type between the semantic type of X and the semantic type of Y. So um, uh, around 2008, I got curious and I just wanted to know well, if these two are immediately next to each other, then why is there something in between here? And why are they, so, 
Why are they far away from each other? Or are they far away from each other? Or how far are they? Or in simple terms, if these two are, uh, can you see my arrow actually? Vipina, does my arrow show? Yeah, yeah. okay. So if yeah. these two are directly connected, well, how many boxes could there be between uh, between semantic type of Y and semantic type of X. And in the extreme case, I, I was just curious. Uh, so this is what I just told you and vice versa, could it be the other way? As in these two are directly connected and there's stuff in between here. So, so that's, that was my research question. And uh, and here I'm just uh, working this out one more time. So uh, there are zero intermediate concepts and there is one intermediate semantic type. Well, how many intermediate semantic types could there be? And then as, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so as a responsible programmer and even as a professor, I'm still doing some of my programming myself. I put sanity checks in my code and one sanity check was that this can never happen. If the concept Y is a child of the concept X, then it can never happen that the semantic type of X is actually a child of a semantic type of Y. Uh, and we call this picture here semantic inversion. So I, I put a line in my program, this can never happen. Okay, and surprise, as soon as I hit the enter key, it started happening. I started getting the message, this can never happen, this can never happen, this can never happen. And then when I was digging in a little more, I found something else, which is, let's just say surprising. I found that the concept Y is a child of a concept X in many cases, but when I map this from the semantic types, it turns out that X and Y are in, in no hierarchical relation to each other. So uh, yeah, if you keep going up far enough, you find a common ancestor, but uh, if there is a, a child and a parent relationship here, so if, uh, if pneumonia is a lung disease, then uh, shouldn't there be a, a connection in a similar way uh, between X and Y? So we call this lack of ancestry. So I wrote the programs and, and this was a, an accidental paper. A lot of my uh, best papers are actually written because some accident happened because we found 38,000 cases of semantic inversion. So this isn't one, one single uh, accident and half a million cases of lack of ancestry. Uh, to put this into perspective, 1.3 million consistent cases. So where it is exactly as it should be. And our team, we will see the couple of people on this Enya paper, our team looked at some of the cases of semantic inversion and, and said, yeah, this is definitely wrong or this can be explained away or, or something like that. But uh, but uh, I was very happy with, uh, with this paper because it was so unexpected. Um, and, and the rest of my introduction is really motivated by a joke, a really old joke, you probably know, know, know it. So two men are coming to court, let's just call them something, let's call them Johnson and Smith. Uh, and they present their arguments to the judge and the judge listens patiently to Johnson and concludes, He's right. And then Smith comes up, explains his view, the judge listens carefully and attentively, and then he says, he's right. And then the bailiff who is sort of standing at the sideline mumbles to himself, but it's impossible. They can not both be right. And the judge hears this and said, yeah, and he's right too. Okay, well, so if that's so, uh, an ontology is supposed to represent the slice of the truth in a specific domain. And, and we are only interested in the medical domain, of course. So then why does it happen that there are pairs of ontologies in the same domain that have different concepts? Why does that happen? And this is actually uh, somewhat of an extension of the 
uh, previous paper that I talked about. So, so uh, before we looked at concept pairs and semantic type pairs, but now we look just at concept pairs. And now you know the method thesaurus is loaded from over 200 different terminologies. So we asked, why, why is it then that we have the same pair of concepts coming from two different sources in the method thesaurus? And, and the difference between is different. Uh, why, why does that happen? And, and we call this hypothetically vertical density differences. To tell the truth, originally we called it vertical granularity differences and submitted the paper, which was rejected. And the very angry reviewer told us that uh, we have no idea what we're talking about, and these are not granularity differences, these are density differences. So we said, okay, from now on, we're gonna call them density differences. You, you might not be surprised that a couple of years later, another reviewer told us, why are you calling these density differences? These are granularity differences, but uh, you can't make everybody happy, right? So here is an explanation of a vertical density difference. So we have two concepts uh, that belong to two different terminologies or ontologies. So, um, and, and I'm not gonna get in, into the weeds discussing differences between ontologies and terminologies. This is a place where many people have died in the past on this topic. So, uh, so we have a concept, GP stands for grandparent, not general practitioner. So we have a grandparent and in ontology one, there is a parent under it and there is a focus concept under it. And there is a child concept under the focus and there's a grandchild under the child. And then because the wonderful, wonderful thing that the UMLS does for us is that it links the concepts cross ontologies. So the same grandparent exists in ontology two and the same grandchild exists in ontology two. But on this side, there's only one concept in between. Uh, I called it Delta to make sure you know this is science. And, uh, uh, and Delta is different from P, F, and C. And now the question we asked ourselves is, but they can't both be right. So which one's right? So one possibility is to say, well, the concepts over here are, are mostly redundant, or the other possibility is to say, well, over here, there's stuff missing and we should actually import it. So we did a study on this. Um, Dr. Jehe, who is now at Florida State University, uh, uh, did these uh, papers. I should say that I had all these papers rejected until Dr. He took over. He, he wasn't a doctor, he was my PhD student. And somehow once he started rewriting them, they were accepted, which shows how important it is to have good PhD students. So we, we, we changed the nomenclature here, but we called it cross ontology diamond. So sort of so a diamond shape. Okay, uh, and here I'm just uh, writing down all the things that I told you. Uh, so we discovered many concepts that in our opinion should actually be important. They should be brought over from ontology one to ontology two and then so uh, I'm not good at talking to ontology curators, but my research partner, Dr. Pearl, is very good at that. And he talked to ontology curators, for example, uh, from the NCIT, the National Cancer Institute Thesaurus. And the answers we got in many cases were, yes, you're correct. This is a possible concept, but we don't want it because there is no use case for it. For example, none of our customers has ever asked for this concept or it's just cluttering up our ontology uh, or it will make it harder to maintain our ontology. So yeah, you're right. We could put this in, but we're not gonna do it. Uh, I don't know, is Jim Campbell online by any crazy coincidence? Because I'm gonna quote him now. Jim, if you're there, this is from you. Uh, Unfortunately, he's not, but I will make sure he sees the slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
because our friend Jim Campbell told us during an AMIA talk, ontology development is not about mine is bigger than yours, okay? So uh, as in, no, we shouldn't really uh, import things. So now, uh, quick pop quiz to make sure you're attentive. Uh, tell me a word that contains the letter Y three times. Okay, I can't see my audience. That's the problem in such talks. Okay, so think for five seconds. A word that contains the letter Y three times. Okay, it's synonymy. So, so after after we were asking questions about inserting question uh, a concept, we started asking another question. What if the concept P is actually a synonym of concept delta, and the UMLS doesn't know that? So this would be a, a non an unrecognized synonym, uh, and and we started to study this. Uh, in, the, in yet another paper. So uh, uh, the blue boxes again are uh, just uh, copied and pasted from an old talk. But uh, you see here, so uh, here are two source concepts. And here are three target concepts. And this is a diamond, okay? So there is this, this, uh, this common structure, co common grandparent, common grandchild, okay? So we have that. And now, even if we are sure that these two concepts should be important, and, uh, and as I said, we're absolutely not sure, but even if we are sure, we don't know either where to put them, that's the red arrow. So maybe this concept goes up here, and this goes down here, and maybe this goes down here, or in the middle, or up, we don't know that, uh, and I believe it's very hard to determine this automatically. So I believe you need the human being to make such determinations in many cases, or maybe in most cases, uh, or it could be that this concept is an unrecognized synonym of this. And now the unrecognized synonym could actually uh, look very different. It could look like this in the middle, it could look like this, and by the way, I don't remember the exact number, but we found paths that were like 11 concepts long. So this here is a trivial example. Uh, there weren't many paths that are 11 concepts long, but we found such paths. Okay, so, uh, so we did the math and I'm not gonna try to explain this. I, I don't remember anymore how I derived this, but this was published. Uh, so you can uh, find the, the derivation in this paper, again, done with Dr. Jehe. Uh, and, and anytime you see an exclamation point, then you know these are gonna be very large numbers. So the point of all this is that even if our diamond-based algorithms tell us exactly that we should import something, the way how to actually do it, uh, there are many, many different ways uh, to do that. And it takes a lot of time and we actually did an estimate of how many hours it would take for uh, doing such an insert by a human. Okay, so now we got curious and I'm, I'm gonna bore you with yet another story. My uh, children had to take math classes and I had to drive them there and pick them up there. So I had nothing to do for an hour. So I sat down in the cafe with, uh, with a good uh, uh, wireless connection uh, with my laptop and I started thinking, uh, well, if there are vertical differences, shouldn't there be horizontal differences also? And, uh, uh, and, and basically uh, the next five papers came out of this one hour sitting in the cafe. So, um, so here is the basic idea of the horizontal density difference. So we have in our beloved snowman, we have gas, green, is that correctly pronounced? And we have it also in medicine, but they have different children. So uh, here in the snowman, there are 14 children. And over here in medicine, there are 13 children. And furthermore, only 10 of those are common. So we start asking a similar question that we had for the vertical difference, which was, okay, so medicine has I really can't pronounce this. Priya peral gangrene gas. Why isn't it in SNOMED? So we started investigating this. 
is it possible to import children? And, and now Dr. Kellogg had taken over from Dr. Jehe, and she actually developed uh, the math about how likely it is that this should be um, this should be a, an import, and I'm, I'm not going to get into this in detail. But basically, if there are 100 children in common and only one missing, it's very, very, very likely that this is really something we should import. On the other hand, if there are two children in common and one missing, well, then that's really much more questionable. And, and this was all uh, developed and published. So. Um, uh, okay, our, our pictures are in, in, uh, in the way. So uh, yeah, let's go on. So, uh, so now we tweet at the uh, medicine as source and the SNOMED as target. And again, we got a surprise. We got a surprise. Okay, uh, let's do a drum roll here. Okay, so we found a pair of concepts that had no children in common, none whatsoever. Once again, something that we were totally not uh, expecting. And, and, and if, you, uh, if you look at this, and I'm not a doctor, but you, you see that uh, in the National Cancer Institute Thesaurus, uh, the benign neoplasms are apparently organized by kind of neoplasm, while in medicine, they're apparently organized by location. So, uh, uh, so totally different. So, so once again, uh, we got a paper out of being surprised. So we, we, we started, um, uh, we started working this out, and and uh, Dr. Kellogg really did uh, uh, did the bulk of his work. Um, so we called this an alternative classification of the same parent. Uh, uh, and then, you know, when you publish in this area, very often reviewers write something. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, but it never happens, or it almost never happens. You have to give numbers to convince people. So, um, so we collected numbers and in horizontal, horizontal density differences. Um, we found uh, 7,000 concepts that could be imported into SNOMED from nine different source terminologies. And we found 1,049 alternative classifications just between the National Cancer Institute, Thesaurus and MedSim and 917 cases of possible imports. So, uh, so uh, and up here, as we are all interested in SNOMED, so there were uh, uh, 1,086 uh, uh, possible uh, imports from this. Okay, so quick recap, and then I, I let Dr. Kellogg take over. So we worked out vertical density differences uh, with cross ontology diamond patterns, we worked out horizontal density differences. And, and then we said, well, can we put these two things together? Uh, and that started sort of the last leg of this, uh, of this research that uh, by now spanned 13 years, basically. So I'm going to stop sharing and, and I let my wonderful ex student, Dr. Kello, take over at this point. Um, so you should be able to, uh, to do that. Yeah. And thank you for your attention. I'll mute myself. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kello. I don't think I can match that level of storytelling, <laughs> but definitely I'm also gonna try and tell some stories. Okay, here we go. So as we said, our next idea uh, was to try to combine both vertical and horizontal density difference. Uh, so we have this uh, Armstrong's axioms for functional dependencies, which basically infers all functional dependencies given in a, on a relational database. 
So uh, we sort of borrowed that property and let's consider uh, we have a collie, uh, which is a dog and then a dog is an animal. So then we can infer that collie is an animal. So putting in basic words, if A is a B and B is a C, then we can infer that A is a C. Okay, so now imagine that these three relations are coming from three different ontologies or terminologies. And none of these ontologies have more than one relation. So each ontology is gonna have only one of this relation. So we thought, can we uh, look at this sort of transitiv uh, transitivity property relations based on this and chain them to identify concepts for import into multiple terminologies at a time. Okay, so this is sort of a pseudo transitivity, but it's not actually because Armstrong has defined another pseudo transitivity. So that's not basically what we are doing. And to uh, give an example, let's consider three terminologies, terminology A, B, and C. And we have these concepts. For example, the concept A1 is identical in terminology A, is identical to concept B1 in terminology B. And when I say identical, it means they have the same UMLS concept unique identifiers. Same things goes for concept B2 in terminology B and concept C2 in terminology C and A3 in terminology A and concept C3 in terminology C. Okay, now, the, again, uh, we thought, could we combine all these things or chain them together to identify imports into multiple terminologies? So we designated terminology A as a target terminology terminology B as an upper source terminology and terminology C as a lower source terminology. So this chaining to reach a higher, uh, to increase the length of the path and to help import sort of looked like this for us. A fire ladder carrying an extensible, a fire truck carrying an extensible ladder. So we named this pattern as a fire ladder pattern. Now talking about the imports, there are basically three possible ways you can import from this one pattern. One is import concept B as the child of concept A1 and the parent of concept A3 into terminology A. So the first pattern of imports goes to terminology A. Second, we can also import concept C3 from terminology C into terminology B as the child of concept B2. Again, this is basically horizontal density difference. There is yet another possible import, which is importing concept B1 into terminology C as a parent of C2. Again, I stress that concept B2 is not present anywhere in terminology A, Concept C3 is not present anywhere in terminology B and concept B1 is not present anywhere in terminology C. So for the paper that we are actually, that uh, goes for the title of this talk, uh, worked on two possible imports. The first one, the importing into terminology A and then importing into terminology B. This is an actual example involving HBO, NCIT, and SNOMED CT. So we have this chain basically starting from the bottom. We have congenital atresia of rectum, which is a congenital atresia of large intestine, which is again an intestinal atresia. What we did is we identified 10 terminologies in the UMLS that had these sort of relationships. So they should have a parent relationship and they also should have an inverse USA annotation, which basically together defines this hierarchical parent-child relationship in an ontology. So since we are considering three terminologies out of the 10 terminologies, that is, sorry, a possibility of 720 triples, and again, uh, the pattern T1, T2, T3 is different from T1, T3, T2, because one is the target, another is defined as the upper source, and the other is defined as the lower source. So when the ontology is changed, the pattern also changed. So what we basically did is we implemented an, an algorithm for identifying all these possible cases of file ladder patterns. We made two samples, one for importing into terminology A, another for importing into terminology B. And these were reviewed by the domain experts to understand whether these could be imported into these terminologies. Okay, moving on with the results. So previously Dr. Geller showed you results in the order of thousands, but this time uh, we have it very less. 
uh, a number of concepts which were identified. Out of the 720 triples that I talked were possible, we identified 26 triples. And of course, NOMAD is present on almost all of these patterns except one or two. And the maximum number of these file adder patterns were formed by the three terminologies, CPT, that's current procedure terminologies, NOMAD CT and medicine. And for import into terminology A, uh, and as I said, we had two types of import. For the first import was import into terminology A. For that, we identified 55 concepts. Uh, for our domain expert agreed with, dom first domain expert agreed with 42 of them. Second domain expert agreed with 45 of them and both of them agreed on 39 concepts. So we basically have about 70% agreement for import. And for importing into terminology B, there were 105 concepts that were suggested by our file ladder based algorithm out of which 98 was agreed, which is 93% agreement. Okay. So all this work we have been talking about all this time basically is extending the ontology. So is this getting actually practically done? So I actually calculated the number of concepts that were added to SNOMED in the past five years. So the two releases, I actually added everything together and I got about 50,000 concepts. Considering NCIT, there was a paper that came out which said, on an average, 700 new concepts are added to NCIT per release, and their per release is basically every month. And my calculation almost shows 40,000 concepts in past five years, which is most the same when you uh, integrate these. Now, so again, we are sort of invariably uh, yeah, accepting that the ontologies are getting extended. And what about the number of ontologies? Just taking COVID-19 into account, there are currently 11 ontologies on BioPortal. So BioPortal is a repository of ontologies. There are so many other repositories, but we're just considering BioPortal. There are 11 ontologies related to COVID-19 on BioPortal. To show how the number of ontologies has progressed over the years, when BioPortal started, they came up with the paper in 2013 in which they cited about 300 ontologies and terminologies on their site. And we actually did a study on the life cycle of ontologies in BioPortal, which I'll be describing in a bit. And there we found that at that time, there were 684 ontologies on BioPortal. And uh, by May uh, 2019, the number was 770. And by April 21, it was 861. And I guess I took this number almost yeah, yesterday or something. It was 895 or 894. So on an average, about 40 to 50 ontologies are being created and uh, you know, uploaded onto BioPortal every year. Okay, now, are all these ontologies that are uploaded getting maintained or are they extended? Are they sort of you know, updating them? So for that, as I said, we performed a study on the life cycle of ontologies in BioPortal in 2018. Again, this was published in AMIA. And uh, we, our main goal was to identify the ontologies that were not regularly updated. And we also wanted to understand what are the root causes for their discontinued maintenance. So out of the 684 ontologies that was there on BioPortal at that time, and we considered large ontologies and basically our definition of large is greater than thousand concepts. And we found only 83 ontologies on BioPortal that were not being maintained for, we took a, a threshold of two years. And to our surprise, I think the ontology community is well knit. We got more than 44 responses, which is about a 58% response. We personally wrote email message to the curators of these 83 ontologies. And among the reasons for the non-maintenance, the one thing I think we can guess is lack of funding and manpower. But other than that, we also found that many ontologies were being merged into some other ontologies and it was not maintained separately. It was uh, being maintained as part of the bigger ontology. And some ontologies were al also had a slower pace of development and some were paused for publication. Okay. So this is basically concludes our work on this part, but of course we have more to offer. And in uh, talking about our current research, 
So uh, as Dr. Geller mentioned, even though they said, of course, this is a possible import, they gave us comments like there is no use case for this concept. This concept is much more fine granular. Uh, uh, so it doesn't support the policy of our ontology to include them and all these things. Okay, so now let me give you a small story about how we came into this new research. And of course, no price for guessing, we are still using SNOMED in, as part of this too. So the uh, co-director of our lab, uh, Dr. Pearl, had to be hospitalized for a long uh, time. So, uh, and as an inpatient actually. So in one of his, uh, during that time when he was walking through a corridor, he saw a nurse dosing off in front of her desk. Uh, so he knew her, so he approached and asked her, why are you not leaving? Your shift is over. So she said, oh no, I have a lot of things to enter into, you know, the EHR records. If I don't do it today, I'm going to forget this and all this data will be gone. And as he says, once a researcher, always a researcher, that got him thinking. And then that expanded with his talks with other doctors and all these things. And that's how we as a research group jumped into the world of electronic health records and clinical text. And that is where we found one of the use case for these fine granularity concepts that we were discovering over these years. Okay. To give a more specific example, I want you to point to this uh, two lines here shown in this rectangle. This is the ground truth manual annotation from the 2010 I2B2 VA challenge. And the challenge was to identify problems, treatment, and test from the clinical text. So here you see the problem is defined as burst of atrial fibrillation. And so different machine learning and deep learning models are still being developed to identify this part. It's a widely researched problem, identifying these things from the clinical text. Now, in the absence of manual annotations, this machine learning and uh, deep learning models cannot be trained, of course, then what would, should we do? We have to fall back to off the shelf annotators. And that's what I show here. So uh, as part B, you see that this is uh, NCVO annotator tool annotating that same two sentences using SNOMED CP. And C and D, you have the annotations from Metamap Lite and from CTX. Here we notice that even though burst of atrial fibrillation is actually a chunk or one concept that the doctor would think to put in, when we annotate it with the off-the-shelf annotators, of course we get atrial fibrillation because it's very common concepts that is present in all the terminology. SNOMED CT has it, Metamap and CTX would also get it because they use UMLS. But BURST, you can see that even though Metamap Light identifies it, it is identified as a separate concept. Okay, and the same thing happens for left-term phlebitis. And these are actually the fine granularity concepts that we are talking about. So we identified basically a gap in the existing terminologies for the purpose of annotating clinical corpora. And with the COVID-19, the situation is actually highlights a need because there is no time uh, to you know, get these manual annotations, which are really costly, requires the domain expertise. And how can we come up with an alternate approach that can actually leverage the terminologies that we have, but for the application of annotating clinical corpora, which is basically uh, natural language written in the way the doctors or the nurses put it there. And again, this would be for another time, but we have two preliminary work uh, in this regard. And so, uh, and we have published it and another journal paper is in the process. Uh, I hope to take two more minutes. So uh, in my native language, there is a song which goes like, I asked you for a flower, you, gave, you brought me spring. Similarly, Susie asked us to present one paper. We have given a history of the research and now we are gonna give you more talking about the history of SNOMED CT re uh, related research at SABOC. So uh, two days back, Dr. Pearl told me that we have been working with SNOMED, right? The time when SNOMED was SNOMED RT and not SNOMED CT. I think the merger happened in 1999 and today Dr. Geller told from 1993 onwards, but just a PubMed search uh, with the author names 
And this is uh, just the papers uh, with SNOMED CT uh, in the title itself. So from 2007, we have been, uh, means maybe before that too, we have been working on the auditing of uh, concepts in SNOMED CT, actually a different uh, major hierarchies in SNOMED CT, identifying the errors, identifying the missing relationships, identifying the issues with the relationship, all these things we have been doing as a group. And Dr. Halper, Dr. Wang, and Dr. Oaks have been working on this. Uh, and we also have a nice tool that helps to visualize large ontologies, layer by layer, different layers of abstraction. You can actually uh, get a broader picture, then you can drill down to it to identify more concepts and areas of your interest. So here we go. These are some 20 papers, but I guess we have 40, 50 uh, of them in this regard. Now, we jumped into the wagon of machine learning, uh, deep learning a bit late, but of course, again, using SNOMED CT. And uh, this is uh, research by Hao Liu. He is a postdoc now at Columbia University. Uh, so what we have done here is we have ident uh, so snomed with every release there are many new concepts that is uh, that are added right how can we automatically place these concepts into proper positions in their hierarchy how can we identify the parents for them so this is what we have done using cnns bert and all these technologies and then of course, we have all the density difference studies that we have talked about and some other references. And I want to thank all our collaborators, some, all the, some of the pre former and current members at SABOC and JIT. And there are many more, but these are some people whom I personally know and I have worked with. Uh, and uh, thank you, Susie, for inviting us and the SNOMED team and Alison too, she's not here, I guess, today, uh, for organizing this. And on behalf of Dr. Geller, Dr. Pearl, and the entire team at SABOC, we would like to say a big thank you for the opportunity. And thank you all for participating and then uh, spending your one hour, your afternoons or evenings with us here today. And yeah, we are open for questions. That was <laughs> spectacular. Thank you. Oh my goodness. That was the stories and how essentially, I don't know how you guys did it, but you were really able to tie in, you know, the basic research from your um, research around vertical and horizontal density graphs to, you know, machine learning and text annotations now. And yeah, that was incredible. So thank you for that. So um, for the attendees today, go ahead and enter your questions into the Q&A box and um, I will read those out and we can uh, have Drs. Klopp and uh, Gellar answer those for you today. Um, to start things off, I have a very, very, very basic uh, question. I was just um, curious, um, Pina, when you were first um, discussing some of your work and you were talking about how you had uh, terminology A as the targets, uh, target terminology, then you had B and C as both the upper and the lower source. And I was just wondering, are you, um, are you, are those um, set as the target upper and lower or are they interchangeable or do you get differences um, based on your computations or is it, you know, set because one of them is a you know, child that goes into another. So very basic question, but I was just wondering what you thought about that one. Yeah, so as I said, uh, for that particular pattern, we worked on 10 different terminologies from UMLS. So uh, we try to get all combinations. So mm -hmm. if uh, so if HPO is currently the target, next time it would be an upper source, next time it would constitute a lower source, can we identify the same sort of pattern like this? Uh, including all our restrictions that it should, uh, the concepts uh, present should not be in the other one. And there should be only this one particular relationship in one terminology. So it rotates. One terminology itself can be a target at one time for one pattern, upper source for another pattern, and a lower source for another pattern. We covered almost all ways which we can permute this 10 different ontologies and identify these patterns. Okay, great. Um, we do have one question in the box. Oh, <laughs> when is your next implementation webinar? Um, so um, I will actually enter, oops, 
I'll enter into the chat box in a minute where you can go to get the information for the clinical research and implementation webinars. Um, I, even though I am located in the US, I am um, taking the European thing and all of the webinars are going on holiday next month. So we will um, meet back on, in September. But if you go to the um, website that I'll enter just a minute into the chat box, um, you'll be able to uh, get any of the upcoming um, uh, webinar information once they are posted. Um, any other questions? Um, I have one for you, Dr. Geller. As um, the collaboration specialist at uh, SNOMED International, I'm very interested in, of course, um, the utilization of SNOMED CT as the reference terminology. And then um, we work with many of our partners, you know, HPO and uh, DICOM and IEG and many, many others. And of course, we want to bridge those gaps. And for us, it, it allows us to allow for, you know, HPO and our um, partners over there who are the true experts on phenotype ontology to maintain their sources. And then for us to be that link to the EHR record. And so we made sure that, you know, we have our scope, they have their scope, but we do have some um, alignment on uh, some of our concepts. And so, in looking at um, some of the research, especially early on, you know, there were vast differences in the number of children that you would see in these different ontologies and do or terminologies. I'm not gonna get into that argument right now. <laughs> and so um, I just wanted to hear like, is this okay? I mean, this is definitely something that we are totally stressing right now from a more implementation perspective. Again, not looking at it from the research perspective, but going into implementation and just to hear your thoughts. Well, uh, that's loaded. That, that, that's uh, I, I'm I'm gonna give you a an answer that probably sounds like a cop out, but when I was a graduate student, I did all the time too. <laughs> when I was a graduate student, we had a research group of like 10, 12 people. And we were arguing about the single concept for half an hour. Does this, does this belong or does this not belong? And it's like every, every uh, the, the people who are real experts in the area, they find a way to, to slice it and dice it finer and finer. So, so I'm a PhD, not a medical doctor. So yeah, I hear diabetes and for me, this is one thing. But even, even if you dig in a little bit, you find out that there is diabetes one and two, and then correct me if I'm wrong, isn't there a non one, non two diabetes two? Um, or is, yeah. Or there is something else like that, okay? So the more a person knows about an area, the more detailed their, the density and their own mental representations are. And, and if, uh, uh, if a, a cardiology expert looks at a piece of ontology and says, hey, I just had a patient yesterday with whatever arrhythmia, and you don't have that concept, of course it has to be there. So uh, on, on the other hand, I, I couldn't tell one arrhythmia from the other, right? So for me, it does not have to be there. For me, I know if there's an arrhythmia, you better call 911. But that's about where I am with my knowledge. So. So it's it's really really a question. So so I do not uh, discount the, the fact that uh, ontology curators tell us no this is uh, this is uh, too detailed. We we don't need this. This is cluttering up things. And and we understand that um, maintaining ontology is actually really very difficult. It's very difficult work. We gave a talk once at the NLM, and and I did this kind of math. Imagine somebody has to spend eight hours a day uh, and, uh, and uh, 300, uh, what, 340 days a year taking concepts and placing them in there. And, and we would like to help that person. And one of the ladies in the audience raised their hand and said, you've just described my life. <laughs> So, so I'm honestly sorry for somebody who, who has to do that. And our viewpoint in all this is we are giving you tools. We are suggesting what you could add. 
And then you, the human expert, run with it, or you tell us, no, we don't need it. And I, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we, uh, there might be absolute truth, but there's no absolute utility. What's, what's redundant for me might be very necessary for you and vice versa. I, I know I was sort of wiggling out from the question. No, that's great. <laughs> I said something. Actually, it's funny. I, I think I was working at NLM and I remember that presentation. I remember that. Are you were there? <laughs> yeah, so that's funny. <laughs> okay. um, so I wrong. do notice that we are getting close to the time, but we do have a couple of questions. So I'm just going to let people know that um, we are going to continue recording. Um, Vipina and um, Dr. Geller, if it's okay, um, we'll just answer a couple more of the questions. Um, if you have to pop off, of course, you know, please do. Um, but just letting everyone else know that we will record. So if you do need to uh, run to your next um, uh, meeting, absolutely understandable. So um, I'll jump into the next question coming from, um, let's see, Dr. Gao. It is interesting to see the argument about size versus utility. It looks like the latter pattern is formed by more than two terminologies. Should we assume that more terminologies will help to identify more latter patterns? Okay, let, let, let me read this one more time. It's yep. interesting to see that. Okay, so uh, the short answer is that, uh, as you saw, there aren't that many concepts that follow the level. And <clears throat> we, we, uh, we, we, Pina, ran a pilot study with four four ontologies, chaining four ontologies. And as far as I remember, there was nothing. So uh, we, 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 we like this research. We would have gladly continued it for a couple more years, but we just topped out. There just wasn't, mere, uh, wasn't more to get out from, uh, from this approach. So, so basically we gave up and we moved on to machine learning. So, so the short answer is no, I think this is the, the maximum, we've, we've reached the maximum that can be reached. Well, Vipina, you wanna add something to this? Yeah, yeah. I would like to add that uh, our work mm, is based on the assumption and cover that mm, you identify the concepts because their queries are the same to identify the identical concepts. So it's based on ontologies in UMLS. There is a possible extension if you get out of the UMLS uh, the concepts have this international resource identifier. So if you can map the concepts in different ontologies using their particular ID, then there is a possibility that we can go out of UMLS because if we look into the UMLS, we have strictly restricted it on parent and is a uh, inverse is a chain. So uh, apart, uh, and there are many ontologies that are not on in the UMLS, which are present in the bio portal. So if you can break that chain and map two concepts to be identical based on the other ID, apart not from uh, like QI, there is a possibility. Another possibility is now there are all these embedding methods, the string matching methods. And also if you know that two concepts are actually identical based on their strings or their names, then we can extend it in uh, that way to find more concepts for import. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, what did I want to say? Uh, oh, our 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 PI uh, just uh, just came up. So just show you our talk. So to show Pearl, I see him and the questions and answers. Um, uh, one more thing that I just uh, realized. Uh, again, another surprise, and that we had like two or three weeks ago. If you look at BioPortal and the UMLS, the number of common ontologies is actually much smaller than expected. I think it was about 44. Well, uh, I thought that uh, BioPortal would be a superset of the UMLS. Okay, second question. <laughs> Coming um, from uh, Jan, oh, Jan. Uh, Philip Sachs, uh, just curious about the process. Are the results regarding the missing concepts, intermediate concepts in the latter example, fed back to the SNOMED ontology curators? Does SNOMED aim at covering as many concepts as possible, or is there some sort of saturation level beyond which no more concepts in a specific area are included? Okay, so uh, I should actually let Dr. Pearl respond to that because he is the 
the genius in uh, finding curators and talking to them and convincing them that you're doing important work. Um, uh, so, so he is many times, uh, if you looked at our list of papers, we actually uh, uh, worked with Ken Speckman, who, who was the chief terminology officer of SNOMED before. Uh, so yes, we, we have, uh, let's say he has made SNOMED aware of uh, findings of errors and missing concepts. I have to admit that, uh, that I'm a little bit less diligent in, in doing that. I'm, uh, I'm quite happy to publish my paper and people, people can find it or people don't find it. And Susie actually found our paper, which, which was- uh, <laughs> People do read it. <laughs> really impressive. So- um, uh, And so I do have to just put in a plug because um, Dr. Jim Case, who is the chief terminologist at SNOMED International, who used to be the chief terminologist at the NLM for the US edition, um, who was a collaborator also with you, Dr. Geller. Yeah. And yeah, we uh, many a times we took in um, some of the um, examples of some of the issues that were found from some of the research and we were able to correct it either in the US edition or promote it. And that's usually how it happens from the SNOMED perspective is it would go through the national release centers, you know, in Germany or Canada or where have you. And then it could either um, be corrected at the national extensions or at the international extension by promotion. So from the SNOMED per perspective, we absolutely have um, a mechanism by which that um, can go through, but the um, feeding does have to come from um, the authors uh, or the um, authors of the papers themselves, um, usually SNOMED, unless it, you're a geek like me and read articles on Friday and Saturday evenings, <laughs> and they'll come in that way. Um, and um, okay, so last question for today. Um, are you aware of any approaches about named entity recognition resolution using the recognized entity fragments from the example sentence and then combining them via some sort of wildcard ECL statement? Okay, Vipina, this one's yours because this <laughs> is really our the recent. Okay, so I talked about our current research and I said we are using SNOMED for it. So actually we uh, recognize these fragments. So we have done two studies, uh, one related to cardiology and another related to COVID-19. So for cardiology, we have been specifically focusing on the cardiology related concepts in SNOMED CT, that particular hierarchy, there are different hierarchies in SNOMED CT that focus on that. And for COVID, we have been uh, focusing on the on all the uh, ontologies in BioPortal relating to uh, COVID. So it's easy to identify these fragments directly using off-the-shelf annotator tools from by concepts from these terminologies. Then we have introduced uh, two approaches called concatenation and anchoring that can actually combine uh, these existing fragments to create fine granularity concepts. So this is actually pointing to a current research. I have the references here. You're free to check. And maybe Susie can invite us any other time. <laughs> <laughs> More marketing. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so... Um... Um, Vipina, I'll um, loop back with you after this webinar, um, and if you can send me your slides, yes, and yes. then um, I will make sure that this recording and the slides are available to anyone on the webinar currently, or you know, anytime afterwards, they are available to you. Um, if you have any follow-up questions for um, any of our presenters today, go ahead and email me, sro at snomed.org, and I will be sure to uh, loop that back over to Dr. Keeloth and Dr. Geller. Um, other than that, um, thank you both so much for presenting today. That was such a fun and interesting presentation. Um, it was kind of a thing for me because I wanted you guys to present, so thank you. <laughs> And then um, thank you to everyone else who joined us today and um, won't see you next month, but we'll definitely see you next, uh, the month after. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for inviting thank us. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.